industrial accidents, ancient Solving poisoners, crime, poison prevention. Spills. This is Toxic History. Dr. Joseph Clemens is going to speak with you about the Goyania incident. My name is Joseph Clemens. I'm one of the first year fellows at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the Guayana incident in Brazil. So, July 16th, 1945 marks the first nuclear weapons destination at the Trinity test site in New Mexico. This day marks the beginning of what would be known as the Atomic Age. Humankind had finally harnessed the power of the atom. At this time, there was, this was promoted as the pinnacle of modern progress. People had high hopes for a relationship with the atom and radiation. Humans had begun to realize the unique properties of radioactive materials throughout the early parts of the 20th century, but still didn't quite understand the full dangers they could pose. At the time, as time and knowledge progressed, though, we began to standardize the use of radiation in many parts of our society, from industrial use, food preservation, sterilization, to the backbone of modern medicine. But much like Icarus, humans have a tendency to fly too close to the sun with unfortunate consequences. So let's now discuss the Guayana radiologic disaster. So here's a quote from Ian Moria, one of the many victims of this incident. It was not their fault. They didn't know, but perhaps some blame must rest with society, which allows a low class of people to scavenge in order to live. 1987, Guayana was a city of more than a million people, scores of tall buildings, a busy airport, a federal university, and large professional cadre of business elite. But as with many other Brazilian cities, there was a vast educational and financial gap between the upper and lower classes and a small middle class. The demographics of Guayana an important role in these events are played an important role in these events. As it was, many people involved in this incident were illiterate and didn't know what the trefoil radioactive symbol even signified. In 1971, the Instituto Guayano de Radiotherapia, or the IGR as we'll refer to it, a private radiotherapy institute in Guayana, was built in the neighborhood of Praça Civita. When the IGR moved to its new premises in 1985, it left behind a now obsolete cesium-137 uh, teletherapy unit. It was left without notifying either the state or the Brazil National Nuclear Emergency Commission. The fate of the abandoned site was disputed in court between the IGR, the local government, and a Catholic organization called the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, which owned the premises. No one really involved took particular responsibility for the leftover equipment, and it just laid there dilapidated. So by 1987, the building had been reduced to three dilapidated walls with large holes eating through the wall uh, sides. There was still uh, a treatment room that contained a relatively intact teletherapy unit, though. Four months before this incident occurred, one of the owners of the IGR attempted to remove the radioactive material left behind and was subsequently stopped by the director of the Institute for uh, Insurance and Civil Servants. The doctor then warned the president that he should take responsibility for, quote, what would happen with the cesium bomb. The courts of Goyas intervened in the interim and basically posted a security guard at the site to protect anything. So on the 13th of September, 1987, Robert Aviles and Wagner Pierre, two young men who lived around Guayana, were looking for some valuable scrap other than the usual, usual garbage they would sell for change. They walked past the IGR site and noticed an abandoned room with potentially valuable metal objects inside. By happenstance, the security guard who was supposed to be guarding the facility and the source had left early to go see the movie Herbie Goes Bananas. Taking advantage of the absence of the guard, Aviles and Pierre legally entered the premise and uh, Upon entering, they found the abandoned radiotherapy equipment. The two scrappers had no clue what they had stumbled upon. Basically, they didn't know uh, what the meaning of the symbols on the equipment meant, and they thought it looked valuable, so they set apart taking it apart. After spending around four hours dismantling the equipment, they began to feel unwell. They both began to vomit due to acute radiation sickness. The following day, Pierre began to experience dizziness and diarrhea and his left hand began to swell. He soon developed a burn to his hand the same size and shape as the aperture of the radiotherapy unit. Neither less, Aviles continued dismantling the radiotherapy machine underneath this mangled tree behind his house. So on the 15th, Pierre visited a local clinic where his symptoms were diagnosed as food poisoning due to something he had eaten. He was told to return home and just rest. Eventually, he underwent partial amputation of several fingers. On the 16th, back at Aviles' house, he finally freed the cesium capsule from his protective rotating head, 
A belay didn't puncture the capsule aperture with a screwdriver. And what he looked inside, he saw this deep blue light coming from the tiny opening he created. He inserted the screwdriver into the object and successfully scooped out some of the glowing substance. At the time, he thought it was some type of gunpowder, so he tried to light it on fire, but it wouldn't ignite. It actually contained cesium chloride, about four, uh, 1,400 curies of cesium-137. So on the 18th of September, thinking he had found something valuable, Avila ends up walking over to the local junkyard near his house. He sells the disassembled teletherapy unit to the junkyard over owner, Devere Avila Sierra. Devere lived next to the junkyard he managed with his wife, Gabrielle Maria Ferreira, reminiscing of his initial cal uh, encounter with the Cessium-137 containing device. Devere states, quote, around 10 o'clock in the morning, a young man appeared in the junkyard who I didn't know. He offered me a piece of lead that should weigh between 80 to 100 pounds. There was another piece, too, Devere described, quote, a stainless steel cat with a little hole in the side containing what looked like cheese, end quote. He thought the piece had no value, so he just left it in his warehouse overnight. That night, though, Devere noticed a blue glow coming from the punctured capsule. Thinking the capsule's contents were valuable or even supernatural, he immediately brought it into his house next to the scrapyard. The blue material wasn't magical, but it did have some powerful properties. The salt called cesium chloride that was used in the radiotherapy machine had an active ingredient, cesium-137. Uh, this radioacid type emits basically beta particles and gamma rays, so it can be fairly dangerous. This is a quote from the International Atomic Agency. It states, it is relevant to note that the interest aroused by the blue glow that emanated from the radioactive cesium chloride significantly affected the course of the accident. So September 21st to the 23rd. On September 21st, one of Fierro's friends success, uh, succeeded in freeing some more of the right side grains of the material from the capsule. And over the next three days, various neighbors, relatives and acquaintance were invited to come see the strange uh, blue glowing uh, objects in this capsule. During this time, Devere and his wife, Gabriella, would, become, uh, extensive, uh, would come into extensive contact with the device and its content. The capsule content ended up being passed around to over 22 people. Quote, they had no idea what it was. People saw the light of the cesium and thought it was a precious gem. Some of them smeared it on the bodies. One guy I saw uh, looked at the glowing material and made a Z on his chest. Now he has a burn in that shape. End quote. Ernesto Fabiano took the crystal piece home in his pocket. He thought it'd be a lovely thing to set in the ring for his wife. The Vier's brother, a bus driver named Odessin Vieira, was given a pebble of the Cestium 137. He would crumble the stone in his hand, wiping the debris on his work clothes. He would end work for eight days straight, driving a public transportation bus without knowing he was, he was contaminated with the radioactive material. He recalls, quote, I carried about a thousand people a day in Guayania. I only realized the power of that little stone that crumbled in my hand on September 30th. Then I was admitted to the hospital where I stayed until around Christmas, end quote. On September 24th, the Vera Justin's brother, Ivo Fierro, succeeded in scraping some additional dust out of the source. He then took the material to his house and ended up spreading some of it on the concrete floor for his daughter to play with. Ivo then set some of the material on his counter where his wife and daughter, Lidi, admired it. Lidi was playing with the substance when her mother called her to dinner. The family's house, bed, sheets, and the girl all received a soft coat of the blue crystals throughout the morning. Lidi became fascinated by the blue glow of the powder, applying it to her body and showing it off to her mother. Dust from the powder eventually fell on an egg sandwich she was eating for lunch. Lidi's mother, Lourdes, states, quote, she ate the boiled eggs while playing. Her little hands were dirty, and she ended up ingesting that powder. In a short time, her mouth turned purple. Within 10 minutes of eating the egg sandwich, Lidi began throwing up. Days after the exposure, her aunt was asked about Lidi's condition, saying, quote, Lidi suffered from lesions on her mouth and throat and ulcers on her tongue that made it impossible to open her mouth. Her nose would start bleeding constantly, and her white blood cell count was low, end quote. At the scrapyard, the viewers' employees, Israel Dos Santos and Emilson Dos uh, Suzez, uh, continued their attempt to extract lead from the uh, radiotherapy device. Eventually, Devere would sell the extracted lead and the remaining components to another junkyard across town on September 25th. By the 28th, Gabriel Maria, Fri Mia Maria Fiera, the wife of Devere, had become, been experienced days of vomiting and diarrhea. She noticed that many people around her were also ill and experiencing symptoms. She eventually made the connection that all the people that were sick had come into contact with the radiotherapy equipment and the glowing powder. Her neighbor thought everyone somehow had contracted AIDS because they were all losing their hair and they had developed skin lesions uh, 
on their uh, bodies. She took one of her husband's employees, Geraldo Del Silva, to the second junkyard which, uh, uh, with the pieces she had been and uh, collected them in a plastic bag. With the bag uh, slung over uh, Del Silva's shoulder, they took it to a local clinic where she deposited the bag on the doctor's desk, telling him that it was, quote, killing her family. At first, the doctor left the bag on the desk. Soon he decided, though, that Gabriel's statements were too worrying, and he moved the bag out to a chair in the courtyard. The testing remained at this clinic the rest of the day while Gabriel was examined at a local hospital. The physician, the physician at the center suspected radiation was the cause, so he calls a physicist to look at the contents of the bag. On September 29th, one of the physicists borrowed a high-dose rate monitor with a scintillating detector, typically used for geological measurements. While entering the neighborhood, the meter went off the scale. Assuming that this was defective, he decided to get a new one, and he returned with a new meter, and the same thing happened. The physicists soon realized that there had been a major radiologic exposure on their hands. The fire department was called to help with the situation. They initially wanted to throw the source material in the local river to predict, uh, prevent additional exposures. Fortunately, the physicists at this clinic stopped them from dumping this radioactive material into the river and thereby preventing a mass contamination to the uh, city's watershed. So on September 29th at 11 a.m., 15 days after the initial theft, 11 days after the rupture of the source capsule, a radiologic incident was confirmed. By 1 p.m., the state secretary of health was notified, and by 4 p.m., all police, fire, EMS, and hospitals had been notified of the radiologic disaster. Plans were drafted to use the Olympic Stadium as the initial, initial reception slash triage point. On September 30th, a small crane would lift a section of the sewer pipe over the bag and source material of the clinic. It would be eventually pumped full of concrete to secure the sources. So by this time, people around town had begun to hear rumors of this large radiation exposure. Hundreds of people start to show up at the stadium demanding full evaluations. Panic and fear ensued. As the day progressed, the Olympic Stadium becomes the default triage site for the city. No de de decontamination was initially done at the stadium in fears of contaminating the local water supply. Initially, 14 people were identified as having high levels of radioactivity and transferred to a, a hospital in the city of Rio de Janeiro. As the day progressed, contamination, monitoring, and clothing room were proceeded at a rapid pace. Eventually, showers would be set up to aid in the decontamination process, but unfortunately, uh, soon into the de triage and decontamination process, an adverse weather event would blow down many of these tents. Gabriel Fiera, Evo, and Lidi are among the people who were initially identified and transferred from Guayana to Rio de Janeiro. After everything is said and done, there would be a total of four direct fatalities from the radioactive material. Emilson de Souza, age 18, and Israel dos Santos, age 22, both employees of Devere, who worked on the radioactive source. Lidi Fiera, age six, the daughter of Evo, and Gabriel Maria Fiera, the wife of uh, Devere Fiera. Devere Fiera survived despite receiving seven grades of radiation. He died in 1994 of cirrhosis, aggravated by depression and binge drinking. Evo Fiera, Lidi's uh, dad, uh, died of emphysema in 2003. Devere's brother, uh, Odessin, points out that his brother Devere and Evo were corroded by guilt of the accident. Quote, it killed them. Eva would smoke six packs a day. He had a deep depression with Lidi's death and died in 2003 of pulmonary emphysema. The deer start to drink much more than before. According to him, he felt the guilt about the accident since his whole family had been contaminated and his wife had lost her life. He died in May of 1994. The death certificate says it was from cirrhosis of the liver. That test showed that he had cancer in three of his organs. End quote. Wagner Piera, one of the initial scrap thieves who survived and permanently be disfigured. Odessin, the bus driver in Devere and Evo's brother, would survive. He later stated that his family was discriminated against by doctors, neighbors, and people on the street. Even after the tragedy had normalized, they were still afraid and blamed them for the radioactive accident. Protests and riots would eventually spring up around the city. One of the major sources of frustration was the burial of Lady Fiera. They planned to bury her in a common cemetery in Guayania, housing her body in a special fiberglass lined coffin. Uh, with lead in it to prevent any possible spread of the radiation. So despite these measures, news of her impending burial caused uh, a riot of more than 2,000 people in the cemetery on the day of her burial. Everyone was fearing that her corpse would poison the surrounding land. Rioters would attempt to prevent her burial by using stones and bricks to block the cemetery roadway. Eventually, though, she would be buried despite this interference, giving at least a little bit of uh, closure to the family. 
So the impact of this incident continued beyond the initial health and physical damage to profound psychological effects, including fear and depression for a large fraction of the city's inhabitants. Further frightened by the specter of radioactive contamination, neighbors, neighboring province isolated Guayania and boycotted its products. The price of its manufacturing goods dropped 40%. Tourism, a primary industry, collapsed and recent population gains were reversed by business regression. Total economic loss were estimated in the hundreds of millions of dollars. If there's one bright side to the story, it'd be the rapid response of the Brazilian government and people. Within just three days of realizing that the glowing blue powder causing so much problem was radioactive cesium-137, all sources of exposure had been identified and contained. The original salvagers had handled various scraps of paper and metal that also became contaminated. These contaminated papers and metals would be found as far away as Sao Paulo. At least 14 different areas of the city were found to be contaminated. Five hospitals, three buses, 14 call cars, 50,000 rolls of toilet paper, several banknotes, and five pigs were also affected. All in all, significant contamination was found in 85 houses. 41 of them needed to be evacuated. Seven houses were so affected that they could not be decontaminated. They were carefully demolished and all the debris was packed away in a special container. There was a considerable amount of contaminated waste to be dealt with. 3,800 industrial drums, 1,400 metal boxes and tin shipping containers. All the metal would be placed into six VBAs or cylindrical containers with reinforced concrete walls, 20 centimeters thick. This was eventually placed into two specially built tanks and isolated from the environment. It was decided to deposit this radioactive material in a remote location outside the, villa, uh, the city. Eventually the storage location would become a museum and tourist attraction. The people of the area also kind of began to embrace the disaster as part of their cultural identity. Because the city of Abidas de, uh, de Goyas hosted the debris of the Cesium-132 incident, they had to uh, put the radioactive trefoil symbol on their city's crest. You can see it there. The accident didn't happen in the city, but it was chosen to uh, receive the radioactive material, so they kind of embraced it as their cultural identity. So the fallout of this, in light of the death, caused three doctors who owned and operated the IGR were charged with criminal negligence and involuntary manslaughter. But because the accident occurred before the declaration of Brazil's federal constitution in 1988, and because the substance was acquired by the clinic and not the individual IGR own owners, the court cannot declare the owners of the IGR liable at all. Eventually, the IGR owners did pay about 100,000 REIs for the uh, derelict condition of the building. But in 2000, the CNEN, Brazil's uh, nuclear agency, was ordered to pay compensation of $1.3 million and guarantee medical and uh, psychological treatment to the direct and indirect victims of the accident and their descendants, down to three generations. So in 1999, a film, Cesium-137, The Nightmare of Guayana, was, uh, was created. It was a dramatization of the incident and won several awards in 1990. Uh, a 1990 film festival in Brazil. And uh, the pinnacle of cultural relevance was that it was also uh, featured in a 1992 episode of Captain Planet and the Planeteers. It depicted a somewhat loosely based version of the event. It was called The Deadly Glow. However, it did feature uh, one, uh, cesium-137 as a radioactive contamination, but unlike the real event, no one died in the cartoon and everything uh, turned out well at the end. The end.